It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And we got just a tiny bit of a late start, just by a few seconds. And I'm going to bl- counting. I'm going to blame the snow. Oh. All right. Uh, I should have brought the sleigh bells in. Could uh, yeah. Those. All we've got are the. Uh, well, I've got. And I've still got. <laughs> is it? <laughs> is it still the new year? Um, yeah. I guess this is the final. Uh, well, if you're watching it live and listening to it live, this is the final uh, January show. It's uh, mm-hmm. one of those uh, five uh, January Sunday shows. So, uh, bonus you, added bonus extra, a- extra, I guess. And uh, it's uh, still down here in the the midst of the city, snowing like crazy. Still coming down. Uh, we've we've heard from Rick DeMaio. Uh, he sent me a text this morning, our meteorologist, mm-hmm. Rick DeMarle, and he says, all snow, all show. All show. Got to gotta like that. And, of course, he will be <laughs> here uh, later on in the 10 o'clock hour with his forecast and give us uh, an update. And there are some pretty impressive numbers here. I'm looking at the stuff that has come down. Yeah. Northwest Chicago. Yeah. Uh, oh, that- yeah, Rome, National, Weather, National Weather Service Chicago. And Romeo oh, oh is that what it said? Yeah. <laughs> NWS, you're right, National Weather Service. Now, is that Romeoville? When, or it yep. says, it, so it says that's, Romeoville. So why does it say, okay, it's from, see, it's confusing. It says National Weather it's Service. It's the National Weather Service office in Romeoville, the Chicago office. All right. Okay. But that's Got not. nine chi- and a half. But that's not sh- Chicago. That's nine and a half inches, but that's not in Chicago. Midway Correct. has seven point four. O'Hare six point eight. Rockford six point oh. Uh, as so, of six a.m. As of six a.m. and it's still coming down. So uh, those of you who are listening uh, in the future, uh, when this is a podcast and this is a a, a video, uh, you don't have to get out and shovel. I will be doing that <laughs> uh, soon after after the I, show. I, I've cleared the bird feeders. The important stuff's done. See, and that's the thing. I didn't even clear the bird feeder. I said to Kathleen, this is an experiment. I'm going to see what the birds do if the bird feeder isn't even clean. And they are. They have descended upon. And, of course, as you know, in my yard, 10,000 sparrows, two cardinals. and eat? Yeah, but it's only 10,000 sparrows all the time. And two cardinals and four juncos. And that's it. That's what I, I was get. was about 10 inches away from a nuthatch who was didn't care if I was there. It was like, see, out of my way. <laughs> I wouldn't know a, a, a nuthatch from a nutmeg because they don't show up <laughs> in my yard. I think they do when you're not watching. I don't think so. I, I absolutely don't think so. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, today, oh boy, we're very excited uh, because uh, we have um, some terrific guests in the second hour. I'll work backward. Uh, we're going to be talking about the the intersection of art and science, which is always a good thing, especially if the art helps people learn about science. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and it, it, it's there's an art piece. Uh, it's a it's a a, um, a 
a not a program. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, an installation, an insta- exhibit. Uh, yeah, exhibit is what it, is what I wanted to say. An exhibit, um, and uh, it, it's called uh, Third Third Coast Disrupted, um, and of course. Chicago is on the third coast mm-hmm. uh, of uh, of the United States, which is uh, Lake Michigan. I imagine you could say that uh, Green Bay is on the third coast as well, and Detroit is on the third coast, and Milwaukee is on the third coast. Uh, but it's an installation to call attention to our climate crisis uh, uh, by uh, having artists do different installations. And that has been, actually been running since September, Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's scheduled to to end uh, 19th of uh, February, and of course it uh, opened in the middle of a pandemic, which is not the uh, the easiest thing to do in the world. And Christine Esposito, who is behind that, she's with Terracom Chicago, uh, is going to be with us along with uh, Barbara Cooper, who is uh, one of the artists uh, involved in, in that project, and uh, Tyrone Dobson. Who's your boss, as I've figured out, uh, Peggy, because uh, he's a senior volunteer engagement manager at the Alliance for the Great Lakes, and he oversees the Adopt-A-Beach program, yeah, which you participate in. Yeah, you, you participate in that a lot. And that sort of takes us to our first guest, who is patiently uh, standing by, because as we talk about water, obviously, we also need to talk about our oceans and and the one thing you can tell about uh, I, I will call you first uh, Nicholas Mink PhD or Doctor Nicholas Mink probably only once Nick and then the rest of the time it's going to be Nick if that's all right with you. That's great. That's great. We don't we we hide the doctor most of the time. I hear it's not a real doctorate for yeah. some people. <laughs> I'm not a real doctor. That's true. Stop using that because uh, you're just showing off, and we know that it showing doesn't. Showing off, yeah. Yeah, it unless matter. unless you're giving injections of vaccine to people, I do. Yeah. I don't want to hear that for a second. I don't want to yeah. hear that nonsense. No. no, you don't want to. So we'll just stick with Nick, uh, as stick you with recommended. Nick. Hey, Nick. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, Peggy. Good to see you, Mike. Uh, good to see you too. Uh, always, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, and and, and I'm going to use that phrase: "Stick with Nick." I'm going to get a bumper sticker <laughs> mm-hmm. that says "Stick like that. Stick with Nick," and and "Stick" will be spelled S-T-I-C, uh, and then yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. so you have good Nick. idea. Yeah, that's that's how that's going to work. And Nick is uh, he is the co-founder and. Uh, chief fishmonger, as they say, but that also means uh, CEO, doesn't it, of uh, Sitka Salmon Shares? But yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, yeah. Ten ten years in now, almost. So wow, the mission continues, and in uh, in uh, 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 in all uh, full disclosure, we need to let folks know that Sitka Salmon Shares is a sponsor of the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and. We're very happy about that because um, we love what you do. We, uh, first of all, I love the fact that you come on the show and you talk about uh, the issues of our oceans. I was thinking this morning we have to team you up with our friend Michelle Hoffman Trotter. Um, okay, she is a uh, uh, um, an educator here in the Chicago area, but she is putting together an amazing documentary called microcosm where she's going out to the oceans all over the world and uh, Mm -hmm. diving in with her cameras, uh, going to see the tiny creatures that inhabit uh, our oceans and what has been happening to them in this time of climate change. Uh, And the two of you would probably have a great conversation because you mm -hmm. go ahead. Nick. That would be, yeah, no, that would be incredible. Uh, Yeah. Ocean acidification is, uh, changing everything about the little tiny creatures in our in our ocean because they can't form their shells anymore. So we're uh, really worried about our food webs in the ocean. No, that sounds great. I'd love to meet her. We're actually um, just starting to brainstorm a, a, a podcast that's going to launch this summer that uh, um, you know that that seeks to do um, uh, something similar. So yeah, and and uh, among the things that she uh, explores are our coral reefs. 
um, mm-hmm. which are uh, under attack and under threat because of acidification, as you mentioned. Yeah. Although we learned last week, and I and Peggy, I'm going to look for it right now because I, uh, Rick sent us uh, that information about the coral reef off of the coast of Texas. Oh yeah, the the. the um... See, uh, yeah, are you going to remember? That, uh, no, I, I want to say National Sanctuary, but it's not. It's, um, I yeah. think okay, I, the, I and, and it's growing. It's doing, is there, there's, there are a couple kind of reefs Actually, in it was the two Gulf. Weeks ago. Flower Garden Banks. That's yeah. it. National Marine yeah. Sanctuary in the sanctuary. Gulf of Mexico. Right. And they yeah. just, uh, and they just expanded it. One of the interesting things about that, and as I mentioned to, to Rick last week, I had never heard of Flower hmm. Banks. National Marine Sanctuary. Well, not I'm not an ocean guy. Okay, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't go out on the water much uh, like Peggy does um, because I tend to get seasick. But um, <laughs> we, we have we, we have uh, the the United States has a really um, um, progressive legacy of conservation of our waters um, mm-hmm. with with marine sanctuaries and uh, all, uh, all through the Gulf and, and the Pacific Northwest and, and the Atlantic, uh, and much like our, our public lands that we know a little bit better, um, uh, protecting our terrestrial habitat. So, um, they're of course under threat too, but they're, uh, a really important legacy of the environmental movement here in the sixties mm-hmm. and seventies and eighties. Well, what was amazing about that area is that the, the coral is actually thriving unlike mm-hmm. the coral elsewhere on the planet. And we did not bring this up last week. I felt bad after the show. I'm glad we're mentioning it now because, uh, first of all, I didn't mention where it was, right off the coast of Texas, and you wouldn't expect that. Um, and it's 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 a, f- a few miles offshore. There are coral reefs there, and, and they are thriving, and there is an abundance of life. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the scientists there look at it, uh, as this, I don't know if it's an, an anomaly, but it's, it's a remarkable area that holds a lot of different life. And as I said, the, said the coral is thriving there, which is so unusual, uh, in this day and age. Yeah. I mean, you know, climate change, of course, isn't just all losers, uh, it's, <laughs> and, and, and destruction and yeah. degradation, you know, it's, uh, it's change. Yeah, that's that's the right way to put it, Peggy. And there are some species here in the next uh, few decades that are gonna uh, that we don't even know about right now um, that are gonna thrive in ways that um, would have been previously unknown, and including you know from the microscopic uh, to the really large uh, you know marine mammals, large some larger marine mammals, humpback whales are doing really well right now. There are just certain things where uh, you're seeing eruptions in the ecological term, eruptions of species that um, are are happening in our oceans, and that that just uh, that are very very much connected to the climate uh, to the climate climate change, and and um, you know the same thing with coral reefs. It's it's uh, uh, everything is in flux in in new ways. Well, and and I'm glad you brought that up because even in terms of plant species, insect species. Uh, there are as not everybody's a loser, as you say. Yeah. Some of the, some of them are winners and are yeah. <laughs> and, and even birds. Climate, climate winners and climate losers is uh, are is kind of how I like to think about it. All right. Well, let's talk about climate winners and losers in terms of uh, the oceans and fishing. Uh, which is what your company does. I should let folks know that Sitka Salmon Shares, uh, and you can go to sitkasalmonshares.com, and um, it's a direct-to-consumer seafood company. Uh, I didn't realize that, well, you're one of the leading providers of premium wild Alaska seafood to, as you guys say, home cooks in the United States. What do you mean when you say home cooks? Uh, I think we mean we don't sell to restaurants or, or grocery <laughs> stores. I think that's that's the simplest way to do it. We really focus on uh, on on people that eat at home. Uh, so that's I think that's that's the that's one of the differentiators. We aren't I guess what would be called like an omni-channel brand or an omni-channel company. We really want to do one thing really well, and that's uh, take 
uh, fish that's been harvested really responsibly by kind of these traditional small boat fishermen and get it uh, into people's homes uh, where they can appreciate it and they can appreciate the care that our fishermen take. They can appreciate that we're not um, uh, we're not um, externalizing the environmental costs of the harvest. Um, they can appreciate that um, we know the fish from the moment it comes out of the water to the moment it, it, it arrives on their doorstep. So, um, you know, that's a little bit about the, the company. And, you know, as I was saying, we're now 10 years in almost this summer, which is pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, we've continued to grow from uh, our first uh, season. We had three fishermen and a couple dozen families. Uh, and now we have uh, probably this summer, closer to a hundred fishermen um, providing seafood to uh, a couple dozen thousand families, uh, which wow. is which is really which is really great to uh, be able to affect that type of change and to be able to promote the type of change that we're seeking um, in the seafood system. Basically, giving giving these small scale artisanal <clears throat> producers access to markets that they would not normally have. Um, and, uh, we, well, you know, we I, believe I, these small scale local fishermen are really the best stewards of the environment and the best stewards of the resource. And we want to be able to create a marketplace that, that allows them to thrive. I hadn't thought about that, that this is, uh, a, a, as good for them, uh, as it is for you. And, and it seems that that has been your marketing strat strategy. You, you mentioned not selling to restaurants. I would imagine it would be difficult to keep up with demand from restaurants. Would it? Yeah. Um, well, you know, you prop yes and no. Uh, you know, the restaurant market is is a, just a much different marketplace. Uh, there's we want to we want to take as few fish out of the ocean as possible. Okay. And we want to add while as still much making value. while still making money. You know, because while you still are making money, but adding as much value to that fish, right, as we possibly can for those fleet members. And really how we do that is by going to direct con to con consumer. If we went to restaurants and we sold, you know, every once in a while we've experimented with restaurants and selling to grocery stores and wholesale. And really what that does is that diminishes our ability to return what we consider a really fair price to our fishermen because, you know, we have to, you know, basically one, compete with wholesalers uh, and two, um, not be able to capture the full retail value of the harvest. So, um, we've, like I said, we've done restaurants. Um, it, it, it's not a horrible thing, but we really just want to, um, we really want to, we want to focus on people <laughs> like you, Mike, and people like you, Peggy. Well, um, and, and it, you are focusing on people like me because, uh, I, I, I have been known to have shares, uh, of Sitka salmon shares because, um, boy, that's the other part of this. I want to get back to the, uh, the, the, uh, the social justice involved in, mm -hmm. Uh, your harvesting, uh, which is really, really an important part of what you do. But let me say, first of all, you've never tasted fish like this in your life, and it's because of the way you put it together, isn't it, Nick? Or you yeah, harvest it. Yeah, it's, it's, it all goes back to these fishermen, right, that are harvesting fish one at a time using really low-impact methods, pulling the fish out of the water, cleaning the fish, icing the fish, um, us freezing it in a certain way that ensures that the that we don't have degradation at the cellular level, um, and uh, and it just creates a it it creates fish like it should taste like, right? Yeah. Uh, you know the fish that we generally get at grocery stores or the fish that we get at uh, most uh, even internet providers. It's all caught in large scale ways using industrial processes, and that really affects the quality of seafood. Um, and, um, you know, well, you, you when, mentioned when on the show, you've mentioned in the past that, uh, and this is what stu has stuck with me. Just one of the things that stuck with me, you say that if you buy fish in a, in a grocery store, there's a good chance it's been there for more than a year. Yeah. Most frozen fish is more than a year old. Uh, you know, that supply chain is probably 12 to 18 months in, it has almost surely gone uh, to somewhere in Asia for processing. It's almost surely been uh, frozen at least a couple times. It's almost surely been caught by a boat with in a really big net that kind of destroys the meat quality upon impact. And, you know, for us, these wild creatures, for me, these wild creatures are so, I mean, 
they're giving their life for us. And uh, I think we need to treat them with the respect that they deserve. And yeah, unfortunately, when you get fish at a grocery store, there's a high degree of likelihood that it's gone through this convoluted global system, uh, been frozen multiple times, and, um, you know, isn't helping fishermen, that's for sure, uh, isn't supporting small-scale fishing livelihoods, isn't supporting fishing communities. Um, and then you guys taste it, right? When you buy fish at a grocery store, you know, it, it tastes, <laughs> people don't know this, but it tastes fishy, right? Even the best right. grocery store fish is pretty degraded. And, um, you know, that's just a function of, of it being part of an industrial supply chain and industrial food system that we're trying to move beyond at Sitka. Well, let's, uh, let's look at this uh, a, a little bit. I have some photos that you guys sent me, and, and maybe you can walk us through some of, uh, uh, I, I don't have a lot here, but I thought you might be able to uh, talk about going up to Alaska and being part of this operation. So, for instance, here, I look at this photo, and all I can th think of is, I want to be there. I want to be there right now, okay? <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen these photos, by the way, so this is, I'm like narrating. This is, this is one of the, you know, Sitka, Alaska is really unique. Mm -hmm. It is one of the last remaining... Um, viable, small-scale, uh, locally-based uh, fishing ports in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it, what you see behind you is uh, dozens, maybe a couple hundred, small-scale fishing vessels. When I say small-scale, that means under 53 feet long. Uh, 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 harvesters that, that live in Sitka, they work in Sitka, they deliver fish into Sitka, uh, and they go out every day making kind of a living in the same way generally that their parents and their grandparents did. And that's really unique when you look at how most fish is caught um, in our grocery stores, which is uh, the vessels would be twice that size. Um, and generally they're not fishing with hook and line. All those little, ma those things that look like masts, right, on those, that you know, on those, uh, yeah. on those, those are fishing poles. Those are just poles. Those are just really large fishing poles that we use to fish uh, uh, um, uh, on hook and line. So, you know, uh, this is a really unique thing. It's so cool to, to be in a place where you have a vibrant uh, local fishing fleet um, and, uh, and also has uh, a really healthy resource that supports them because we have really good management in Alaska, but particularly in Southeast Alaska. So Sitka is a very unique coastal community. This, this, this looked no different. I mean, let's take it back to the Midwest and you know, this doesn't look all that different than some of the smaller, some of the fishing ports that might've existed in the third coast a um, hundred yeah. years ago, 70 years ago that were kind of wiped out by, you know, pollution, resource degradation. And then finally the, the sea lamprey really did did yeah. uh, that invasive species that came in and wiped out a lot of our commercially viable fisheries in the Great Lakes. You know, these types of fishing communities used to exist in, you know, outside of Chicago and the third world, you know, where, what is now the third world in Milwaukee, Sheboygan, um, up in Lake Superior and, and Sitka and the Pacific Northwest and particularly Southeast Alaska is a really cool place where these small scale fishermen uh, still survive and what Sitka Salmon Shares tries to do is uh, allow them to thrive, uh, right? And, and, yeah. and how we do that is all the unfortunate thing about this picture is most of these boats are still fishing for what I would call the global commodity system or the global industrial system. Okay. And they're having to compete on the global commodity system with farmed salmon, right? And, uh, and farmed fish that they just can't compete with. And that drives down their prices. And unfortunately what it does is it makes these small scale fishermen have to deliver for va volume rather than value. Really, these guys are perfectly, when I say these guys, these boats you see in this picture, these guys are perfectly suited to do, they're artisanal producers fishing for an industrial marketplace. It's this huge mismatch. It, it would be like going to the Logan Square uh, farmer's market or, you know, a farmer's market in Wilmette or Lockport or anywhere in the suburbs and thinking about those small scale producers having to sell and compete um, in a marketplace like 
like Walmarts, right? Wow. And and that's what we're trying to get away from in, in, at, at Sika Salmon Shares is to build these small scale producers the type of markets they should be fishing for, which is artisanal markets, low volume, high value for people that you know uh, are interested in um, investing their food dollar in the perpetuation of these small scale fishing communities, and in return getting a totally different product than what you would get at a grocery store. Right? All right. And and I assume this is one of your boats. Uh, otherwise, you probably yeah. wouldn't have taken. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, what this is, is one of our... Go ahead. One of our co one of our co founders uh, dads and a dad and sister, but very typical. This is about a thirty seven foot boat. The sun fishes and it's, you know, it fishes for halibut. It fishes for a couple different types of salmon, and uh, you know, mom and pop family operation. Father, daughter, son, um, hoping to hand it down to his kids. Uh, this is the type of thing we're trying to. Uh, 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 this is the type of operation. Uh, that we're we're trying to uh, allow to continue uh, with our system. Yeah, and uh, here's uh, more of the operation with a big camera overhead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is uh, we do uh, one of the we haven't talked about. I don't know if we ever talked about this on this show. I mean, maybe the first time I was on here, we we really have to do a lot of culinary education, and this is us doing some culinary education. We didn't have. <laughs> we used to. We we also have lost because we've lost fish in our diet in the Midwest so often, we've lost the understanding of how to cook fish, right? And uh, we used to think like when we first started, like, oh, everybody will be able to, you know, they, they're buying this fish, they should be able to cook it. And and the reality is one of the big things that we do at, at Sitka Salmon Shares is we uh, invest significantly in the ability for people to appreciate seafood and cook seafood and it's super cool because what people really when people get our program like me right you realize that you can do anything that you do with beef or pork or chicken you can do with fish and once you start and, and feel way better about it it's a very low impact type of protein the uh, wild harvested seafood is one of the best proteins uh, in the context of its climate impact. And um, you can feel good about it. And so we do a lot of culinary education at Sika Salmon Shares. This is called boat deck cooking. So we go on boat decks and we have fishermen cook for us. Ah, okay. All right. It, 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 I'm going to put you on the Family spot. Family recipes. If, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you had one thing to tell people that they're doing wrong when they cook their fish, what would it be? They overcook it. <laughs> they yeah. It. Okay. Wild, get... wild, wild fish is wild fish is oh, so lean, right? And and the reality is, I, I believe that a lot of this fish is best eaten raw. <laughs> um, you know, we have a sushi grade process that allows the fish. You know, we freeze it to fifty below, so it's really safe. And uh, we hold it at really cold temperatures uh, over twenty four hours, and so you know. <sighs> The Canadian rule is what they call it, is no more than 10 minutes per inch, right, of, of fish. And a lot of Midwesterners, people are like, oh, I put the, I put the salmon in the, in the oven for 25 minutes. And I'm just like, ah, 25 minutes for, a, you know, it's like eight minutes, 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so yeah. That's, yeah. that's the biggest culinary thing is uh, overcooking of, of the uh, fish. Kath Kathleen and I had a house out in the Pacific Northwest uh, for about 17 years, and that's one of the things we learned from the locals there um, uh, in uh, Washington State at uh, Lake Quinault was uh, don't overcook your fish, really. Uh, yeah. it just just be cool. Take it easy. It doesn't have to be uh, completely done. And one final photo here. Um, what Do you know what kind of fish that is? Do I? I mean, who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> Are we asking Peggy? <laughs> That's a hippoglossus. It's a halibut. It's a Pacific halibut. Um, it's just one of the largest. You made that fish. up. You just made that no, up. No, no, it's hippoglossus. <laughs> I even know the scientific term. Uh, it's one of the largest. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, uh, flatfish anywhere in the world. They grow to. Three, four, or five hundred pounds. This fish is probably about twenty or thirty pounds. Um, super unique local halibut fishery off the coast of Sitka. Uh, harvested on hook and line. Um, there's nothing like a line caught um, halibut from Southeast Alaska. 
Um, and this is a, a really beautiful uh, uh, photo. And we, uh, yeah, it is. And, and what it what it shows me, uh, and and I don't know if this is uh, unique to you guys, but there's a lot of women working on mm -hmm. these boats and, and in your company. And that's something yeah. that I think uh, we should get to here. We need to take uh, a short break. But when we come back, one of the things I want to talk about is that uh, social justice uh, for your fisher families, uh, fishing families, and uh, the idea of having um, a, a wide variety of people uh, out there uh, harvesting the fish. Uh, that is Nick Mink, and we will not call him doctor because he's not a real doctor. Uh, <laughs> not a real doctor. You're, you're not Just a real. Do uh, you're not a real doctor unless you play one on television. Um, <laughs> Uh, Nick <laughs> Nick Mink from Sitka Salmon Shares. Go to sitkasalmonshares.com. In fact, in just a second here, you're going to see all about it. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We'll be right back. At Sitka Salmon Shares, we take pride in being a seafood company that's a little different. In fact, 10 seasons ago, our motto was we do salmon differently. Nowadays, we harvest 15 species of wild-caught Alaskan fish, but still call ourselves Sitka Salmon Shares because, well, we're a little different. Our difference starts with our fleet of fishermen Hello. who own a slice of the company mm. and are paid above industry average. They deliver fish to our docks in about half the time as other fishermen, which means higher quality of fish for you. And we never buy our fish from large processors where we don't know how each fish was caught or handled, like most other companies do. Another difference is our fish plant, which we own too. Our plant freezes fish about twice as cold and twice as fast as the other guys. This produces unparalleled quality at a cellular level. Ooh. Our difference extends to you, too. By joining our community, you band together with thousands of other people who want to make a difference in the way that their food is produced. This allows our fishermen to harvest fish just for you, with the respect, thought, and care that the fish, the ocean, and you deserve. So, be a little different. Join us at SitkaSalmonShares.com. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. Hello from Happy Leaf. This is BJ Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. What kind of fish have you got today? We have rock caught sea bass, albacore and pickerel, <laughs> sand dab, yellowtail, tuna fish and mackerel, bluefish, sailfish, top and top and if you wish, swordfish, whitefish, herring and gefilte fish. And, and that, that ain't all. all. Go <laughs> in for me. <laughs> oh, I had to throw that in for uh, you, Nick. Uh, <laughs> I was looking and for... And where's that from? <laughs> of course, it's the Three Stooges. Whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, yeah, what yeah, is that? Yeah. Do you what? know what movie that's from? Um, no, I, I, well, I could now I'd have to track it down. I wonder if I've got huh. it. Here. Can, oh, 
I could try to find it otherwise. Uh, you could because uh, I, I that because that got me going when I was uh, <laughs> uh, 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 looking for that. Uh, so I found this. Oh, a microphony and a phony at the mic. Get Whoa! Out of there. <laughs> but up, uh, and of course, the one that Peggy's been asking for now for like three years. Quiet, numbskulls! I'm broadcasting. Okay, so there we are. Uh, uh, now you've got you've it's got the Three Stooges fish song. Exactly, the Three Stooges fish song. Well, which, we'll have to add that into our our uh, marketing. I think it's so. Pretty good. I think Nick, you should be singing that yourself every time uh, you're I, out there. I, I should. We, we sell a few of those fish. Actually, you know, that was the first time I'd seen that particular cut of our little video too with this commercial that we. Oh, really? We had. Yeah, it was. It's it's quite nice. Yeah. It's quite good. I like it. I try to stay out of the marketing and the advertising piece. I like to keep my head clear <laughs> from the commercial activity <laughs> of the company. I don't blame uh, you. Uh, and do, do, I. Do you want to know where that footage came from? What footage? It's a Three Stooges short called Cuckoo Cavaliers. Really? And okay. their company was Larry Hook, Moline, Line, and Curly Sinker. <laughs> okay. But bum Oh, there you go. But uh, <laughs> back to the uh, the the spot that we ran for uh, Sitka Salmon Shares. Yeah, I saw that. Believe it or not, mm-hmm. it came across on uh, Facebook. I was I was okay. cruising Facebook and I saw that and went, "Wow, that's yeah. fun! I want to run that on the show." So I. Talk to your marketing people, and I said, "That's the one I want. That's the one I want to. I want to oh, run." Good, good, yeah, yeah. We did those at the height of the when the the pandemic first started. We were bored, so we made a little group of those uh, kind of seafood. We call them seafood shorts. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But that was that was a slightly different version of it. So I liked it. I liked the changes we made. Oh, I like the uh, animation. It's very clever, very, yeah. very fun, yeah, and great. that's why I want to run it. The, I also <laughs> did one myself, which you're not going to see now because we're going to play it later in the show, uh, but I put one together uh, specifically because folks need to know that uh, they can get $25 off, uh, and again, full disclosure, Sitka Salmon Shares is a uh, sponsor of the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. You can get $25 off your or any order mm-hmm. um, just by clicking on... Novak 25 okay and uh i believe we have that up on the home page uh, yeah i think you have that up you, we yeah, also you, have a question for somebody which leads into part of that same conversation is there a way to experience sick salmon as a one-time purchase oh was this uh we just started doing a little bit more one-time purchase uh, uh, stuff. We, we called it, we call it our freezer, right? So we're right. a community supported fishery, right? So the big thing about our community supported fishery is we, we harvest fish seasonally. We get it to people's doorsteps seasonally. Um, and we do so in a way that reflects the particular abundance of that season, right? So when we sign up for our community supported fishery, we don't exactly tell you what you get in your box. We kind of have an understanding, but we really allow the, the, the fishermen and what they're catching to reflect, um, uh, to be reflected what's in the box. And, you know, as we've grown, um, you know, what, what, there was actually kind of like a, a utility to this because uh, we would have opportunities to catch fish that like maybe there was too much of it to put in a box or mm-hmm. we don't want to sell to farmers market. We don't want to go to restaurants, right? We're, we're not selling to restaurants. So we've kind of started looking at ways in which we could take the harvest of our fleet or uh, a couple of the partners that we work with and uh, move it along to people in kind of a one-time shipment program. And we just launched that this January. Um, so uh, at the beginning of the month, it's gone super well. So, you know, the community-supported fishery acts like a community-supported agriculture program. You sign up at the beginning of the season, and you get a, m- month, a box of fish delivered to your doorstep once a month, just like in a C- in like your CSA. Uh, but this allows people to, you know, hey, I'm not sure if I want to sign up for a full CSA or a full share. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be home all summer. Um, And it allows you to be able to just uh, sign up and get a box of fish and it gets there to your doorstep in a week. And, um, you know, what we do as our community supported fishery, it's, it's, it's how we best support our fishermen by uh, how we best support the ecology of Southeast Alaska is by harvesting fish that's there seasonally and getting it to our members seasonally. But this is this is another way in which we plan to be able to take 
let, let's call it about 10 or 15% of our harvest and uh, start um, uh, getting people to be able to buy it, um, you know, kind of on demand mm -hmm. and uh, deliver to their doorstep in a little bit more of a, uh, you know, convenient way. I hate to use the word convenient because, uh, but that's kind of what it is, you know, it's a more well, yeah, convenient Yeah, you want way people to try it. it. We yeah, want you, people to we want, we want people to try it, and the goal is you sign up for the for the community supported fishery, you sign up for the CSA because really that's the program that's best for our our fishermen. That's the program that really allows us to kind of I guess maybe call it work our magic on the waters, which is they go out there and they catch fish, and we know what's in season, and they harvest it, and then we put it in people's boxes. Um, based on what we just harvested. It's such a cool thing because, you know, the global seafood supply chain as well as the global industrial, you know, agriculture supply chain makes us think that we should be able to get tomatoes year-round or right. asparagus year-round or salmon year-round or, you know, any of these species And the year same round, salmon year-round, the same. Yeah, the same salmon. But yeah. the reality is, is that these fishing season lasts most of them last weeks or sometimes months, right? And so mm -hmm. that, and that's because of the environmental nature of that fishery. That's because of biomass concerns. That's because of, um, you know, how the, the biology of the fish. We, we have really good seasonal management in place in Alaska to harvest these fish at like just the right time to ensure the, the, uh, that they, these species are perpetuated uh, over the course of, uh, you know, human that's, history. Yeah, that's, and, that's and part that's of the whole deal. Totally you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but you can now go on our website and, and, and do one-time purchases <laughs> well, here and there. But they're very, yeah, very seasonal. Yeah, they're and very seasonal that. as well. And also they're, you know, they're very limited, right? We don't, we're not out there harvesting as much fish as we possibly can. What's what they kind of are is like, okay, we have a little bit left from this season. Let's pass it along and let people uh, get uh, a chance to to purchase it and and uh, and taste the fish. And I'm hoping, Peggy, that uh, you you put uh, the uh, Novak 25 up yeah, there. Yeah, Cam as, Cam posted that. Uh, yeah. fan fantastic. Oh, thank you, Cam. Uh, one of your. Uh, your marketing, great marketing yeah, people. I've been yeah, yeah, he's incredible. Um, and somebody did ask if you have to be home for the delivery. No, no, no. It just shows up at your doorstep, packed on dry ice. Uh, you know, have, most people, most, most people aren't home. Yeah, most people aren't. Home. And you've got they these great, great uh, 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 insulated bags too, which yeah. uh, we're still trying to return some of them to you guys. But yeah. you guys are you're actually really cool about that during the pandemic. Uh, the driver said, "No, no, no, no! Don't worry about it. We'll get them back at some point." Uh, yeah. And and it takes us back to the comment you made about when we you talked about doing the commercial. You were bored, but l the last time you were on the show uh, was in April of last year, and at that time, like a lot of people, you didn't know what was yeah. going to happen to the company. You didn't know whether yeah. it was going to just go belly up. No, no pun intended. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a bad metaphor Hopefully for a fishing not, company. Right? Yeah. But, um, as it turns out, like, you know, as we've talked about on this show, in terms of agriculture, a lot of small farmers did very, very well last year, um, because they had a very specific audience, uh, and, and customer. Uh, and it sounds like a, a very similar thing happened to you. Yeah. CSAs and CSFs and small farmers and small fishermen, after kind of a period of adjustment over a couple months where we were trying to figure things out and and with, with a lot of anxiety and a lot of uh, 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 uncertainty, what began to take place was people wanted to, in the, in the context of the pandemic, one, people weren't going to restaurants, right? So that was a positive thing for small farmers that direct market, small fishermen that direct market. But I think more importantly, you know, it turns out, yeah, People wanted to, you know, the pandemic really highlighted the need for a safe and secure food supply that people trusted. And, you know, it goes back to the fact that our small farmers in the United States and our small fishers in the United States really offer that, um, particularly when they're connected uh, directly with, with consumers. And, 
Um, because of that, you know, I think uh, we did. We had a really wonderful season last season. We're gearing up for uh, a lot less growth this year, which will be <laughs> exciting. But we're definitely at a, a, a different uh, uh, company at this point than we were last year. And uh, it's so cool that people, you know, across the Midwest and across the United States were going on their, you know, on their Google, they were Googling, you know, where can I get, you know, you know, non-industrial meat? Where can I, how can I get seafood delivered to my door? And it, it ended up working out um, pretty well for us. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, let's use that to springboard. And, and, and by the way, I, I want to emphasize something that we have been sort of throwing out there and people might not be aware of. A lot of folks who watch this program are aware of CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. Yeah. You, you've been talking about CSF, Community Supported Fishery, and it basically works in the same way where yeah. the, 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 mm -hmm. the masses get together and say, okay, we're going to support this organization so that they can continue to, uh, in your case, uh, fish sustainably, keep uh, yeah. the the populations up in, in our oceans, not throw out the big nets and haul in everything yeah. uh that that comes with yeah. it and uh which brings us to a question that we just got asked here um online and it was a uh, um oh dear and now i can't find it it was mac was asking about yeah she was asking are there river restoration programs there we go yeah help support to yeah. help help with fish supplies so hold on a second i've got to plug my computer in uh-oh we're losing uh, power here. <laughs> losing power. I hate you when that happens. Hear me. You can still hear me. <laughs> yes, hopefully. we can still hear you. Yes, yeah, you're, 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 you're good. Do, <laughs> oh, do, yeah, you know. Do uh, they give you power the, in that tiny little room there? I'm not sure yeah, that there is any power. My tiny desk. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, we're doing a lot in the – Sika Salmon Chairs, interestingly, kind of came out of a – uh, the Sika Conservation Society's Wild Salmon Conservation Program. And so there's a really unique relationship between our company and the desire for us to uh, have better uh, rivers. And, and uh, you know, one of the unique things that's happening all over the Pacific Northwest is removing these really big, large dams that brought, blocked these salmon. There are a lot of really good environmental groups, particularly in the Pacific Northwest that I know of, that are um, you know, Wild Salmon Nation being one of them. Um, you know, Trout Unlimited is a really wonderful organization to support. Um, but, you know, we need, we need really clean river habitat uh, and really good uh, uh, water quality in our rivers to be able to sustain, of course, not only salmon populations, people just think of salmon, but right you know, there's all these anadromous species that anadromy being they start their lives in rivers and then they move out to oceans and then they go back into rivers, um, you know, that really rely on healthy rivers and that link between river and ocean. It's this liminal space, right, where it, 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 these estuaries where good, clean uh, fresh water uh, flows into salt water. And that's, you know, it's an, it's an incredible abundant uh, place that ensures that our oceans are, are healthy and ensures that our, you know, a lot of our, you know, coastal communities are healthy. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, interesting you talk about the dam removal and just this week, and thank you, Mac, I'm going to give her a ding. Uh, she sent me a series of uh, YouTube videos that were taken when the Elwha dams were oh. removed from the Elwha River, which is in mm -hmm. uh, northwestern Washington State in, on the Olympic Peninsula, where I used to have a home, a vacation home. Um, and what it took to remove those dams and the, the consequences of it. And it's just a fascinating series of, of videos because the they showed the salmon and, and that were at the base of these dams that couldn't get up into the dams and, and where you could see them sitting there. When are you going to bring these down? And then the dams were brought down. And of course they immediately went right back up into the area. And it, and it doesn't just change the river. It changes the ecology, uh, the ecosystem, oh, yeah. ecosystem of the whole area, which is, yeah. 
uh, a reason to remove a lot more dams, yeah. I would say. People don't under, you know, these are watersheds, right? It's it's this linked terrestrial and 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 uh, and uh, and um, uh, water habitat that it, it's all connected, right? We like to kind of compartmentalize things in Western culture, but you know, you start removing dams and you change the forests, you change the you change the grasslands, you change the whole hydrology, everything about changes, this, yeah. the whole hydrology, and and uh, a a plug for a really wonderful movie if people are interested in checking it out. It's called Damnation. It's a documentary. I think you can find it on any of your big uh, uh, internet movie providers, uh, and it does a wonderful job about talking about uh, talking about and exploring the importance of having these healthy watersheds. Um, it, it's focused on the Pacific Northwest, but we can tell that same story in the Midwest. We can tell that same story in the Atlantic. We can tell that same story in the Gulf. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so uh, we don't have a lot of time left. And one of the things I really wanted to get into here, uh, two things. We got two things and we've got like uh, seven and One of them is probably what I'm waving my yeah. hand about. So. Uh, oh, what what is it you're waving your hand about? Um, Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay. Yeah, that's one of them. Let's do that real yeah. quick. And then, uh, uh, then we can wrap up with... Uh, the how to build a better seafood system. Uh, the last couple of times you were on the show, you talked about the threat posed to Bristol Bay in Alaska by uh, the pebble mine that uh, was looking for a permit so that it could basically despoil the area. Um, and yeah. of course, uh, mine for copper and gold. Um, and oddly enough, it got resolved in November <laughs> by, of all things, the Trump administration. That had to be a really, a, a bit of a shocker. Yeah, yeah. We, we, it finally seems like the, at least for now, the threat of Bristol Bay, uh, of, a, of a giant mine uh, called the Pebble Mine at its headwaters is uh, hopefully been resolved. And, and why Bristol Bay is so important, right? And why it's such an important landscape is, one, it is the most significant sockeye run anywhere in the North Pacific. Um, and what that makes it is most of the time when you buy salmon at a grocery store, that's sockeye, really bright red. Anytime you go to Whole Foods, that's Bristol Bay sockeye. And it also sum supports an incredible um, set of communities of fishermen and uh, both native and newcomer uh, who are there uh, because of these salmon. It's the, one of the most uh, significant wild salmon habitats anywhere in the world. And, um, you know, the, the short-sightedness of even thinking about putting a large-scale gold mine uh, and copper mine on that habitat was just truly profoundly stupid. And it seems like it, 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 it is, uh, it's, it's now uh, not going to happen. So a huge environmental victory. That took and, place right and the, it the turns Trump out that, that there there were objections from people within the Trump administration, including Donald Trump Jr., because, yeah. well, guess what? He fishes over there, and he yeah. understands what it's like to have that pristine area. And, and that's a problem that I have with people who go over to the side of environmentalism. Often it's only because it affects them personally. If they don't yeah. seem to have the empathy to realize that even if I don't fish there, it might be a good idea to preserve that area. But that said, I'm glad that got done. And, and I would guess that with yeah. the uh, advent of the Biden administration for now, that area is safe. Yeah, we feel good about uh, we feel good about some of the uh, changes that the Biden administration is making, and we see we feel really good about some of the opportunities there are for uh, more significant um, protections of our uh, waterways and our oceans and our and our uh, our lands here in the United States. So it's uh, we deep breath. <laughs> yeah, really, congratulations! A sigh of relief. Congratulations. Well, it would have been a, a, just a catastrophe. It would have been yeah. an unmitigated yeah. disaster. Uh, finally, yeah. and we just have a few minutes uh, for this, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm fascinated by is um, your responsible harvest and your, you know, your, the investment in how a CSF helps build a, a better seafood system. And part of it is financial uh, and, the way, and the way you treat the, uh, your fishermen. Uh, and your fisher families. Um, and folks might say, 
well, you know, uh, Sitka salmon shares is a little pricey, uh, but in terms of the environment and the social justice, it's not at all, is it? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we have a little chart where we show it's about $8 a pound more than your average grocery store, but we can break that up into you're investing in small-scale fishermen, you're investing in environmental sustainability, and you're investing in um, making sure that these – uh, you're getting the highest quality fish possible. So that's kind of where we see that eight bucks a pound. And it, it is it is a little bit more pricey, but uh, what that does is it allows us to return um, on most years about 20% more uh, for uh, the harvest for these small scale fishermen. And in return, uh, they get to um, catch less fish and the fish that they do catch, they harvest in a different way so that we can ensure that the, the quality is there. So, um, you know, they, be, they are fishermen. Uh, many of them are owners of the company. They participate in the company's governance. Um, they participate in, uh, in the direction of the company. And, you know, and then more importantly, you know, not only making more money and uh, being able to sustain their livelihoods is, you know, we operate on a model of fair and transparent pricing. Our fishermen know what they're, they have a baseline price that they know they're going to receive at the beginning of the season, which is so different than the rest of the uh, uh, industrial fishing uh, uh, or larger scale fishing uh, operations where a lot of fishermen don't know what they're going to receive for the fish until after it's sold. So after mm. it's sold, to a larger commodity market, that's when a lot of small scale fishermen find out what they're gonna get. So Yikes. It's, just a, it's just a different way of operating where we really, you know, our fishermen are owners, our fishermen are partners, and, and it just allows them to have a lot more um, confidence in their own operations. And, and I will add, uh, one, Kathleen wandered by here and she said, quality. Don't forget to tell, talk about the quality. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's a huge, huge difference. And, and that is really, really one of the important things about it. But yeah. also, and, and, and I'm looking at that page, and you can find it uh, if you go to uh, my blog post, go to MikeNovak.net, click on where it says, How You Help Us Build a Better Seafood System. And one of the things is environmental stewardship. Guess what, folks? Environmental stewardship costs money. It's, um, uh, I've been dealing with recycling issues this week that at some point soon, Peggy and I are going to talk about on the show. Um, I think we got to get it out of people's heads that everything comes free, that there's no yeah. cost to anything. There's no cost to saving the planet. There's no cost to saving species. There's no cost to, as I said, environmental stewardship. Yeah. And we've broken it down. I, I mean, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but well, I've got it right here. It says that for, for other, other fish, it's environmental stewardship is zero per pound. Okay. Oh, you've got it. You got it. What is I, it? It's a couple bucks, right? Right. A dollar 35 per pound to make sure that we have some environmental quality in yeah. on the yeah. planet. Yeah, and that's part of us being trying to be transparent, right? This yeah. is really what we're trying well, your, to do. Your transparency, like, your transparency yeah. is fifty-five cents a pound. I love the way you've yeah. broken this all down. That's oh, why I'm telling I'm, you. So, yeah, yeah. Someone should show that because we really like. What's the difference between buying sixteen or eighteen dollar a pound fish at a at a at your grocery store supermarket at your fish market? and buying the $25 or $26 a pound fish from us. And we really want to just be like, well, look, no one's getting rich doing this, trust me. <laughs> but we really just wanted to show, look, you're going to pay a little extra for quality. This is what's what it looks like, the environmental uh, sustainability, the, the conservation ethic. And, and that's really what you're seeing in that price. You know, the price, you know, is about the value that we're creating along the entire supply chain. Um, to ensure that you're going to get fish that you're going to feel good about feeding your families that are going to take care of these small scale fishermen. And actually the big thing is, it's going to taste better, right? Yeah. So it's kind of the better for you, better for the planet. And it, the big thing is that it makes fish eating fun and you can eat fish instead of chicken or pork or beef or, and you, and you know that you're, you're, you're supporting a system, uh, that's really trying to do things better. Well, if you're watching the program right now at MikeNovak.net, just scroll down the page. You're going to see the Sitka Salmon Shares logo. It says $25 off. You click on that, 
and it takes you to a page that will give you uh, a chance to put uh, Novak 25 in the code and you'll get $25 off your your share. So uh, take advantage of it. Uh, we're out of time, Nick. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. It's such a pleasure to talk to you as yeah. always. And uh, much luck to you in 2021. Uh, <laughs> maybe things will calm down for you. Yeah, let's let's uh, do women in the fleet next time. I want to talk about gender and uh, and uh, and fisheries. That would be a really fun topic. Absolutely done. Okay, <laughs> we will we will do that. Let's set that up. I definitely want to have that conversation. All right. Again, All go, right. go to sitkasalmonshares dot com. Nick, uh, have a great Sunday. Uh, dig yourself out of the snow if you can, and we'll talk yeah. to you soon. <laughs> All right. Take care. Good to All see right. you, Peggy. Good to see you, Mike. So long, Nick. It's the Mike Novak Show with. Peggy Malecki, uh, everybody stick around now. The confluence of art and science. Boy, it's uh, all science all the time. We'll be right back. Okay, let's say you have a problem. It's Monday morning and your car won't start. What's the first step? Find out what's causing the problem. Or, better yet, find someone who can. It's impossible to remedy an issue without first determining the cause. And when there's a problem with your tree or shrub, that's where Bartlett Tree Experts comes in. We call it Plant Analysis and Diagnostics. We'll start by accurately identifying your tree. This is important because a tree species will indicate its typical traits and tolerances, as well as any susceptibility to insects, disease, and other stress problems. Next, we'll look at the tree from the ground up. We'll check the condition of the soil, Examine the root collar for decay or other issues. Look at the color and health of the foliage and inspect for damaging insects or disease. There's a lot to consider when making a correct diagnosis. And your local Bartlett Arborist has some unique support. A team of top scientists at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories. We can collect soil or plant samples from your tree and shrub and send it to our lab for analysis. Our lab analyzes over 20,000 of these samples each year. So you can count on an accurate diagnosis. Our lab also functions as an education center for our arborists to receive ongoing training. So after diagnosing your tree problem, we can also provide the most advanced arboricultural techniques and treatments to help solve it. Successful plant health care is all about timing and early detection. If something is concerning you about your trees or shrubs, don't hesitate to let us know. We're happy to help identify the trouble with our expert plant diagnostic services. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a sip on of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawns, serene. Oh, yeah. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. And as you can see, we got a lot of people here on the screen. Uh, and uh, we're going to be, we got Peggy and me uh, crammed up there uh, up in the upper left uh, <laughs> and i'm still tweeting in the other browser hey oh are you so uh <laughs> Hello, keep, keep tweeting well we want we want our folks uh, uh to uh to know what's going on and and we're getting a lot of email today uh what did what did i say uh there's a correction the code is novak 25 did i get that wrong or did you get no that I, I i it's it's what i'm typing into um restream it doesn't always sometimes ah. Yeah. Okay. Re re restream typing gets goofy. Uh, that's okay. You go back to your <laughs> typing, and I will uh, <laughs> talk to these folks, the wonderful folks who are with us on the screen. And in the upper right-hand corner, it's Christine Esposito. Christine, how are you? Hey, Mike. Good to see you. Hi, Peggy. It's good to see you, too. She's the founder of Terracom Chicago. It's an environmental communications firm. And uh, about a, it's more than a year and a half ago, uh, that you were on the show, Christine, and you said, hey, I've got this idea. I'm going to 
do this uh, thing uh, that is called uh, Third Coast Disrupted, and I'm going to bring scientists and artists together, and we're going to talk about uh, climate change, and we're uh, it's it's going to be really cool. You're going to have people like uh, Catherine Hayhoe and and other folks, and then of course, uh, and of course, that was supposed to start in September of 2020. Uh, yep. You got to us much earlier. You were kicking it off a year in advance, and the, lo and behold, here comes a, a, a pandemic. Yay. Oh, boy. Uh, but you've managed to deal with that, and you've still had uh, the project, and it and it has gone off. Explain how that has worked. Well, the project, you know, it's, it's an exhibition of newly commissioned artworks that culminate a year-long conversation between artists and scientists centered on climate change impacts and solutions happening here in the Chicago area. And when I saw you, we were just about to have our kickoff retreat, uh, which was a day long event for the participating artists and scientists where they could meet and learn about each other's work and talk about and look at on the ground examples of what's what's happening in terms of impacts and solutions. And that went off fine. That was before the pandemic, uh, as you <laughs> say about it before. Then we had a series of um, salons, artists, scientists, salons, where they could continue this conversation about local impacts and solutions. And the pandemic affected that in that we had a couple of our salons at different locations as we had planned. And then we had to have them via Zoom, which was which worked out fine as well. The exhibition, that conversation, that extended year long conversation inspired these new artworks that are still on view at the Glass Curtain Gallery of Columbia College, Chicago. And that opened September 8th as planned. It was originally going to close October 30th, but it's been extended through February 19th. So we have two more weeks. You have two more weeks to see the show. And the show is all about conversation, you know, the conversation between the artists and the scientists, the artworks are one by our, your other guest, Barbara Cooper here, are all intended to spur conversa further conversations about climate change. Because as our advisor, Catherine Hayhoe has said, the most important climate action is talking about climate change. If we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we act? So action begins with conversation. These artworks our conversation starting and our programs as well. We've had five so far. We have one more this week uh, with Barbara and Tyrone and uh, Professor Tim Holine at Loyola, Loyola University, Chicago. Um, so it's been great. The pandemic, you know, who, <laughs> who could have imagined? <laughs> but uh, the show went on. It's been very well received. And we're excited about, you know, having this extension of the show. And it's been so well received. There's been interest by other venues and we're hoping and working on trying to travel it. Fantastic. And the, uh, the salon this, that's coming up on February 4th, that's this Thursday, is called Breaking Down Plastics, Building Up Solutions. And, of course, that takes us into the the discussion today, the plastics is just one of the things you've talked about uh, over the months uh, in uh, your project, uh, but it is such an important part of our environment, and I'm glad we have Barbara Cooper, uh, artist, you can see her on the lower left, and Tyrone Dobson from the Alliance for the Great Lakes. They're both going to be involved in this, as you said. Uh, let's start with you, Barbara, because I've got some uh, photos of the artwork you've done, and you work in various media, uh, wood uh, primarily, but also metals and, and now obviously plastics. Uh, what am I missing? <laughs> um, well, actually, this, this new work that I developed specifically for this exhibition um, is with aluminum screening and um, Abaca paper pulp, beeswax, and um, plastic bo water bottles that I uh, picked up off the streets in my neighborhood. And um, so it is a totally new configuration of materials for me. And it was a lot of fun uh, to work with and to try to integrate um, these ideas in a more specific way than I have in my previous work. I would say all of my work is responding to issues um, that I 
find in the natural world that I feel can become metaphors for um, our own personal experiences. And But this work is much more uh, specific and pointed. All right. Well, let's 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 examine that uh, before we get to Tyrone and talk about the <laughs> the everyday uh, encounters with plastic. But speaking of metaphors, what I'm going to show you is not uh, is not actually uh, a metaphor, and it's probably okay. I'm going to have to bring you guys out. I didn't set it up for that. Here we go. This is uh, this is amazing. You sent me this photo, and I was gobsmacked buy it and if you can read that on the right it says found at uh, camilo point beach in hawaii plastic glomerate in parentheses uh, in uh, quotations a type of rock formed when plastic debris perhaps in a campfire fuses with sand rock shells and coral geologists think it may become an enduring marker of our impact on the earth and that is one of the most terrifying things i've ever seen in my life barbara uh, it was for me as well. I came across, uh, not this image, but this kind of description. I was leafing through some old uh, National Geographics in 2016, and I came across a comparable kind of image. And I was, I, I think a lot of my work deals with the idea of layering and strata and the kind of history that we see, perhaps in the strata in the side of a cliff or the um, ridges that you might see in a seashell, all indicators of, of kind of either geological time or growth time. And when I saw this, I just was terrified. Um, and, uh, and it has sat in the back of my mind. And then when Christine approached me about this, exhibition and the, the entire project, I thought this was a great time to, after kind of mulling it over for all of these years, to try to figure out a way of embodying um, my response to this. And is that rope that has also been embedded in there? It, it looks like a polypropylene rope. Yeah, so it sure does. Of, uh, and then there's probably, you can see there's little pieces of blue and this is and that, so it, whatever was thrown into a campfire, most likely, that might have been started by burning plastic bottles, uh, yeah. and then everything else that was in that fire, you know, just all kind of fused together. So this is our uh, new man-made rock. Wow. And 10,000 yeah. years from now, if we still exist, and there's a great bit of doubt about that, um, they're going to find things like this and shake their heads uh, and, yes. say, uh, and say, These, what, what were those folks doing? Exactly. These will be the markers of our time, just as um, we might discover um, kind of uh, chiseled arrowheads from another time or various other kinds of tools. This is what we are leaving. <laughs> except that, <laughs> except that uh, archaeologists now look at a chiseled arrowhead and go, that was useful. They'll look at this and yes. just <laughs> and say, what? What? What were they thinking? Uh, exactly. All right, let's go to uh, now. Okay, that's bring that, but this is your work. So ex ex uh, explain what we have here. Okay, so this is, I, I think I sent you two images. This is a detail of the other image, but um, so th this is part of a form that was Okay, I can, go, I can go to that image. Yeah, is let's that... look at that first. Okay, okay. super. Uh, so I, I was kind of working um, with this idea of um, digestibility or, or in, indigestion that um, uh, I, I, I'm feeling that kind of the earth as well as our own bodies are no longer able to kind of digest or process all that we're putting into it. And um, so that was kind of um, the reference for these forms. I frequently work abstractly. Um, and um, but with trying to have uh, a reference to um, different organisms or plants or things like that so that we could that they become metaphors. So within this form and then um, you can see that there are areas on kind of the lower right and up at the upper left. Um, you can see that there are there are these bottles that have been crumpled and then 
um, integrated into that structure. So if you want to go to that detail mic, there you can uh, see it a little bit better. So, and this is what I've been feeling and finding um, is that these, and, and this is kind of a, my response to that image of the plastic glomerate is that um, it's not that we're finding these separate pieces anymore, it's that they're actually embedded into things just as um, yeah. we are starting to find plastic elements um, within human tissue. Uh, we're finding it in plant tissue and we're certainly finding it in the bodies of fish and other animals. Yeah, that's, that is also uh, uh, quite disturbing. Let's look at one more here. Uh, and what have we got? Oh. Uh, okay, so this is another one of the forms. And um, this was kind of almost a more cellular. Um, I was trying to kind of explore different kinds of vocabulary of uh, a form here. So this is almost a more cellular, um, maybe coral-like kind of a structure. And again, you can see there's little bits of plastic, especially at that lower left end and then up more towards the top and center, uh, where the plastic, again, is is totally embedded in and in separate for the form yeah um and the rest of it is made of what so um these structures are made out of um aluminum screening some of them uh were old screens that uh i had replaced and um and uh saved the screening and um giving it another life cycle and then um, they're stitched together with wire and uh, the whole thing is coated with abaca paper pulp uh, which I kind of pour over it and keep pouring it up until it kind of builds up a surface or skin and uh, then coated with beeswax. Okay uh, that's that's really cool stuff uh, but it takes Thank us you. to you uh, Tyrone uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier in the program, you're kind of uh, Peggy's boss because she participates a lot in, in the Adopt-A-Beach program. Um, and uh, uh, you, uh, you engage more than 15,000 volunteers in beach cleanup across eight uh, state, Great Lake states, and uh, and and uh, then you're also involved in the Chicago Ambassador Program, the Alliance's Chicago Young Professional Councils. You and I had a conversation the other day when we were just testing the audio and the visual here. Um, you seem to be a guy who thinks that the average person can have a huge play a huge role in cleaning up uh, and solving our plastics problem. Would you Would you go into that a little bit? For sure. First and foremost, Peggy's my boss. Uh, <laughs> so, and, so I definitely would be remiss if I didn't say that. Uh, but, you know, the average person can has a lot that they can do. I think that, you know, we oftentimes find ourselves in a position where we think we're powerless to get anything done. But in, in regards to plastic pollution, the average person has a lot that they can do. Um, there's, you know, some of the simple things that I think about is this idea of overconsumption. Uh, so first, you know, just think and audit your own life and see, you know, where can you cut back um, your use of single use plastics? And I'll use myself as an example. Um, before I started at the Alliance, I tell people I was a volunteer manager. I wasn't an environmentalist. And so one of the very first things that I, I did is I talked to volunteers and started to see why they volunteered with us. And a thing that came up a lot was the use of plastic straws, cutlery, things like that. And a volunteer was like, well, why do you need that? You can just put your lips on the glass. And I was like, well, you know what? You might be onto something there. Uh, so I stopped <laughs> buying plastic straws and, eat, and refusing them at restaurants at myself. Um, and so those little bitty steps make a difference. It's not just like one straw. So if I, if, you know, if I didn't use a straw, that's okay, that's one person. But imagine if a million of us didn't use plastic straws or, a, you know, like that, that like exponential growth that can happen there. So there's a lot to be said about the overconsumption, auditing your own everyday practices to see where you can cut back because that stuff does make a difference. Um, and the other thing that I say in terms of what you can do is educating yourself on the issue in and of itself. So just understanding the plastic pollution problem um from start to be to, to from start to end 
Um, and then it's not just enough for you to know that information, but then also for you to take that information and share it with your friends and family. In the age we live in, um, you know, information or disinformation is very prevalent. And so people are oftentimes very apprehensive to hear informa new information from untrusted sources, but you do trust your friends and family. So once you learn something, you vetted that and you feel that it's true, go ahead and share that with your friends and family, whether that's on social media, um, like we are likely forced to do now just due to the pandemic, but even face to face when we're able to get back to that, uh, to that space. And then, you know, I'd be, I will be remiss as the volunteer manager if I didn't tell you, get involved. There's still ways that you can get out there and have an impact. Um, you know, our Adopt a Beach program, as Mike said, you know, we have around 15 to 20,000 volunteers every single year that are doing Great Lakes cleanups. Um, even some of those cleanups happening in neighborhoods uh, in the watershed. There's ways to do that as well. And our ambassador program are individuals that go out and speak to folks about Great Lakes issues, one of which um, is plastic issues. So getting out there and volunteering also makes a huge difference too. Uh, talking to your boss then, Peggy, um, uh, you, I know you participate in a lot of the beach cleanups there on, on Lake Michigan. What kind of plastics are you finding uh, when when you do that, you talk to me about that all the time, Peggy. Oops, I'm sorry. I think I lost your audio. Hang on one second. Let's pop it back on. There you go. Ah, that's that's why when I say something, nobody's answered. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I thought it was just me. Um, I think it's changed a lot. What has been found in the last 15 years that I've been participating, it went from a lot of things related to um, uh, like the six pack rings and cigarettes and things like that and now the plastic tends to be um, bottle caps and lids but tons of microplastic just all these little broken down pieces that were literally at the beach with sieves picking up sand and and just getting these piles of microplastics and it's uh, just everywhere and and much of it seems to be from food products yeah so uh, have you noticed that shift as well tyrone absolutely so you we can almost count on it um, that anywhere between 85 to 90 percent of all of the total trash that we pick up every single year will be partially or completely made of plastic. That is across the board. Um, and, and in some areas, that number skyrockets up to around 97 percent or so of the total amount of trash we pick up. And keep in mind, we pick up tens of thousands of pounds of trash yeah. every year. Um, so it's, it is a huge, huge problem. I definitely agree that those microplastics um, are the, are a large majority, usually in our top three of the items that we pick up every single year. Yeah, and, and I'm at the beach all the time. And especially after there's big wave events, there's, there's almost a line along the shore of just small plastic bits and that have any, washed up out of the lake. Anybody's welcome to, to, to jump in here on this. I have people write to me. Because I do this show, and some of them will say things like, well, we have to ban all plastics. And I, you know, shake my head or I smile and I say, well, that's not going to happen. All right. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of good that plastics do in the world. Uh, imagine trying to make syringes out of glass, uh, going back mm -hmm. to that. I suppose we could. Uh, we're going to need 300 million of them, or not quite that many, uh, uh, certainly, and we need them planet-wide. So we do need some plastics, but how do we control it? I don't even know how we start. Uh, one of the things that I wrote on my blog post, because uh, our friend uh, Maggie Caritas, who's also uh, uh, a... a, 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 a a, a communications expert sent me mm -hmm. an article about extended producer responsibility or ESP, mm -hmm. which is the idea that you put it on the people EPR. who EPR. I'm sorry, EPR. Sorry. Um, right, EPR. I, well, I put ESP there. I got a. That's a typo. Uh, EPR. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, EP, EPR. And the idea that it's the manufacturer that should bear some responsibility because one of the things we have not done is take into account the cost down the road. All we talk about is what's the cost now for the consumer? Well, the consumer wants something cheap. Well, guess what? It costs a lot more down the road. So is there anybody who want to address this and, and how we might bring these folks into it? Yes, I, I think uh, extended producer responsibility is really important. And um, 
just as you were talking with the previous guests on with the Sitka salmon shares about um, the uh, inv environmental costs don't come cheap. I think we have to think about the if the long term um, life cycle of anything that we produce, and a perfect example of that is in the nuclear power industry, where we say that nuclear power is cheap and it's clean except we've never figured out what to do with the waste <laughs> and the waste is a huge issue and it will undoubtedly when we do figure it out it will be very expensive financially and environmentally to um mm -hmm. to address that issue um and uh in regard to getting rid of plastics um yes i think there are very important uses of plastics certainly in the medical industry, um, but I think the perfect place to start is with um, single-use plastics um, that have gone up, the use of which have gone up 300% since the um, COVID pandemic has started. Yeah, that's, and, that's, um, that's to, to interrupt you, that has been a terrible problem. One of the really horrible things about the pandemic is that plastic use has skyrocketed. Um, and and J uh, Peggy sent me an article yesterday that I was reading about coffee cups uh, and how uh, reusable cups were banned in a lot of uh, uh, coffee shops. And there's no scientific evidence that they cause problems, that they spread the disease. And yeah. yet those coffee cups are still banning the reusable cups. And, and they can't recycle the cups that they provide. Or, or it's very difficult. You know, Starbucks says, yeah, they're recyclable. But do you do it? No, you really don't. And that's part right. of the problem. Yeah, they're recyclable at the right location. With if enough. You have access well, to it. Yeah. And, and you many, are in, many, in actuality, are not recyclable or they are toxic in recycling. Yeah. They're either mm -hmm. lined with a thin plastic or they might be lined with PFAs, um, which are toxic. Um, if containers are made out of plant-based plastics, they are only recyclable or compostable in industrial right. compost. So if Get they're not reach, if they're not taken to the right kind of facility, they're basically trash. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or even plastics that are marked. Uh, one of the articles that you had shared, um, Mike, talked about plastics that are totally recyclable, but then they put a metal label on it. It right, some it's, label, and it makes the whole thing not recyclable. These are ways that we are causing issues that are unnecessary, absolutely unnecessary. Um, so, Tyrone, when you when you get together on uh, Thursday to talk about breaking down plastics, building up solutions, what are you going to be suggesting to people? So, there's a couple of things. Um, one, you know, on this issue of recycling, I will also add that it's important to know what the recycling rules are in your area. And I mm -hmm. see this all the time as a person that leads volunteer cleanups that want to, uh, groups want to do like the maximum amount of good. So they don't want to just remove the, the waste from the beach, but they also want to then like recycle what they can. And it's exceptionally difficult because I mean, I mean, we're in eight states, all of those municipalities in some cases have different recycling rules. And so it's really hard to make sure that we're doing the absolute most good in terms of recycling. So like know what your recycling rules are in your, in your area. That's just a, that's a freebie, uh, Mike. Um, but in terms of next week, what we'll talk about is a little bit of a preview. Back to that audit of what you do. When I started at the Alliance, I remember I got approached by one of our communications people I said, hey, Tyrone, I want you to take part of a challenge for us for social media. And I was really busy. I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that, whatever. And I didn't really listen to, like, the full totality of what I was signing myself up to. <laughs> but I had signed myself <laughs> to, to do a week without single-use plastics. And I went into it as a very competitive person. I was like, oh, yeah, this is totally going to be easy. Totally got that. Um, and I realized immediately that it was very, very hard <laughs> to do that. Um, and it's hard because the, the single use plastic has really permeated almost every single like section of our lives. Um, so just the next time you go to the grocery store, just be cognizant of what's like, what's going on there. Right. Um, so like, that's hard. And I, I, I would I'm encouraging everyone to do that. Take that, take that week, even a day to say, I'm going to try to do this entire day without single use plastic and see how far you get, see how far you get before you fall down. <laughs> um, and then I think that will start to, that will, 
help you, you know, understand like, you know, how pervasive the issue is. Uh, the other thing that you can do is is take the Alliance's Plastic Free Pledge. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, again, it's all about that personal step that you can take to have an impact on the environment. And that matters more so than what you think that it does. Um, so those are, that's like, you know, one of the things that I share with people all the time. I, I laugh, I can laugh about it now, but I definitely was crying about it at the time. Um, because I, I, wanted, I wanted to be successful. It wasn't like I was, you know, just doing it just, you know, for the sake of a social media experience. It was like, I truly wanted to do it. Like I was like, oh yeah, because like, I understand the issue, right? Um, and it was very, very challenging. To say the least. And folks can go to greatlakes.org to find out more at Alliance for the Great Lakes. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, we're just about out of time here. I, uh, Barbara, can you I were going to. Yeah, go window? ahead, Christine. Tyrone had earlier mentioned that he, he urged people to understand the plastics problem and engage with the problem. And, and that's what Third Coast Disrupted Artists and Scientists on Climate is really all about. Is mm -hmm. It's a different way to engage people with these issues that isn't somebody telling you about it. It's you interacting with these artworks, experiencing these artworks, and causing you to think about that. So the exhibition, it's um, there are very thorough safety precautions at the gallery for people who do want to go there before February 19th, mass required, min maximum mm -hmm. 10 people in the, uh, in the gallery, and they'll screen you beforehand. Um, but there's also a virtual tour that people can take that is up. I know you have the link on your yeah. site. Yes. It's also on the homepage of thirdcoastdisrupted.org. Yeah, and we've, so these we've shared it in our social. Engage. I'm sorry? Uh, and we shared it in our social this morning too. Yes, yes. So that's another way if people are uncomfortable going to the gallery, but it's just a way to, uh, a different way to engage with these issues and, and start to um, investigate them. Yeah, go, uh, and that's thirdcoastdisrupted.org. Uh, I, I have a different link here, so I'm going to change that link on my, uh, my blog post. Uh, so folks can go there and as, and, and as you mentioned though, I have the virtual tour, uh, link there so you can, and, and you can see photos, you can see videos, you can see interviews of the artists talking yeah. about their works with scientists, um, which is so important. I mean, I love having scientists on the show, but I love having artists on the show because it's through art that we learn. Um, and it's one of the ways we learn and it's so important to, to do that. Uh, so, uh, with that, I, I know Barbara, we were going to do, all right, give me like one really important thing that people can do, uh, to have a, uh, an impact. Okay. Well, actually I, I would just say very quickly, um, Tyrone's, uh, personal challenge, I think is super important. We as consumers have a lot that we can do, but there are also, um, there's a city uh, ordinance that's coming up, uh, a um, plastic free water ordinance. There's a um, state legislation that's coming up and there's also um, national legislation. Um, Tom Udall uh, introduced a bill last year that hopefully will come up again. And um, I'm part of a group here in Chicago called Organizing for Plastic Alternatives. We have a Facebook page and a website and um, we're trying to do um, a lot of actions as well. And I would just say a real simple thing that you can do is just remember that instead of getting things in plastic bottles, you can get things like, uh, here is, um, I'm trying to get it in front, there like uh, uh, shampoo and conditioner. We can get things in bars instead of in plastic bottles. So that's one very th simple thing. Or here is a... Um, uh, bamboo toothbrush. I mean, there's a lot of alternatives that are out there, maybe not in your regular grocery store, but plenty of things online. And there are plenty of stores that are starting to handle these kinds of things that are not made with plastics. Fantastic. All right. I see Rick DeMaio waiting in the wings to talk about the snow that's still coming <laughs> down here. So thank you all, Christine Esposito, Barbara Cooper, Tyrone Dobson. Thank you. I want to have you all back and, and we'll chat some more. Uh, and again, you can uh, be part of 
uh, the uh, the conversation this Thursday, February 4th. Mm-hmm. It's called Breaking Down Plastics, Building Up Solutions. And get to the exhibition, uh, which is through the 19th. It reopens tomorrow. So uh, you can do that. Wear a mask. You have to have a mask there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they only let 10 people in. And so um, you should feel safe uh, at the exhibition. Or watch it online. Thank you all. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, we Thank will- you. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We'll be right back. At this time of year, we spend a lot of time indoors with our plants, so help them thrive. The plants you're viewing were treated with Leafzyme, a foliage spray designed to activate beneficial microbes already present on the leaves. A spritz every few weeks promotes growth-enhancing microorganisms that process dust and other particles into nutrition that indoor plants can absorb through their leaves for beautiful and vigorous growth. Go to blazing-star.com and check out their BioGarden line for home gardeners. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collective Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. Hello from Happy Leaf. This is BJ Miller, the horticulturist here on staff. The best way we can help you be successful with indoor gardening is to provide you with a really great grow light. There are a lot of choices on the market and it can be extremely confusing to decide what you need. Our goal here at Happy Leaf is to provide you with a light that lasts a very long time and makes your plants really happy. We have several satisfied customers, including our friends Mike Novak and Peggy Malecki, because we have specifically designed a light that is versatile, it's very effective, and it is extremely simple to use. Our lights are perfect for seed starting, but you can do so much more, especially these months of the winter. You can supply yourself with your own leafy greens and herbs, grow lots of different types of vegetables, keep your small fruit trees thriving, and your houseplants will think you've sent them for a day at the spa. From small boat fishermen to your dinner table with safe, free, no-contact delivery. Sitka Salmon Shares brings premium wild Alaska seafood to your door. They're a community-supported fishery offering shares just like your local CSA. All fish is wild caught in season with respect for the limits of the ocean. Line caught and traceable to their fleet. Use promo code NOVAK25 for $25 off the first month of a share. Go to SitkaSalmonShares.com slash N-O-W-A-K. Yeah, I had to bring back some of the what? oldies and wear a mask made from my thong, which is the best line in the whole thing. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Yeah, you know, okay. I... Okay. Yeah, well, it's 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 an appropriate song because, boy, if we got some uh, snow out there and baby, it's I cold. It drifts outside. Yeah, and there's uh, Mr. DeMaio. Uh, uh, good morning, Rick. How are you? Hmm. Good morning, Mike and Peg. Sorry I didn't listen to your um, previous segment. I was outside playing in the snow. Yeah, out at Har- <laughs> Harms Woods. I saw what you texted me. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it, that well, that area is only about um, three blocks west of me. Okay. Um, so I can either I can either get on the um, I can either go in the parking lot and then go north cross country skiing, or I take my dog other and uh, walk. What are you doing? I'm, oh, there you go. <laughs> there's the photos of uh, Rick DeMaio uh, out in Harms Wood. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's my, that's my dog, Jackson, or Jax, as we call him. Um, and he loves snow. He's a cockapoo. I don't know if your dog does this, Peg, but uh, does your dog snow plow? Pushes his head underneath the snow? Uh, he, he, a variation. <laughs> <laughs> he's not not as low to the ground as Jax is. He's higher, but he's he's always it's like the the scents are totally different in snow. It's like snuffle, 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 oh, snuffle. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. And then he so, eats snow. Um, yeah, we he were loves out eating for... snow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, as long as it's not yellow. Um, but uh, the bottom line is uh, we were <laughs> it's out. It's a dog. I don't know if it matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it matters to kids see you right after that, right? Um, but uh, the, the bottom line, uh-oh, uh-oh my internet connection get here? Uh, just a little bit. You're, 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 you're a little frozen <laughs> at the moment. I don't want to see how you, oh, that's better. There we are. We're back. Okay. Um, but the bottom line is we went out for about an hour this morning and um, there was no one, um, there was no one out on the path yet. So we were basically, as Carlin said, uh, we began a path. George mm-hmm. Carlin would have a joke like, you never, you never mind using the path that's there, but did you ever one day just start a path? So we started a path and we had a blast. There was about eight inches of snow on the ground. Um, up here in Evanston, we got six and a half to seven. Maybe on, turn your video um, off, Rick. Uh, Rick, turn your video this off. This week will be at or above normal for the month and for the season, and we are, in fact, these two snows, the six <laughs> okay, hold, hold, of, Rick, um, Rick, Monday night, and then Rick, the seven. Rick, can you turn off your video for for the moment? Uh oh, we seem to have lost him completely. I'll text. All right, yeah, got him, got him totally. For oh, there he is. He's back. Okay, it's okay, Rick. Turn on. T- can you turn off your video? Just try turning off the video. And uh, we'll do. Yeah, we'll you know do. what? I'm just going to. I'm just going to go closer to the um, closer to the router. Hopefully that'll help. All right. Ah, great. Yeah. All right. So tell us, you were talking about the amount of snow that you had out there. Yeah. So officially, 6.0 inches at O'Hare this past Monday and Tuesday. Um, seven inches overnight, and this is the first time we've actually had two six-inch snowstorms in the same week since January 2014. Um, wow. So that's seven years ago. Yeah, it's quickly turned around. And um, there's more on the way for the rest of today, probably another inch or two uh, before we maybe get a little bit of rain on Thursday and maybe some really super cold air coming at us uh, Saturday night and then again into um, Sunday. You know, you mentioned that. You sent me uh, a map of the super cold air coming in, and then I was watching. Whoa. <laughs> and I was watching the weather. Um, in fact, I'll pop that back up. There we go. I was watching I, weather last night and I did not see any mention. Nobody seemed to mention it. Well, it depends on whether or not you want to be cavalier or kind of take a conservative approach. But just before we went on the air, I just checked the latest guidance from the GFS, not the European, but the GFS continues to show very, very cold air. I sent those maps both to you in email. Yeah. About two minutes ago. My re- uh, oh. Okay. The cold air response was la 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 la. <laughs> what do you mean the cold? I don't know what you mean by that, Peggy. Oh, how cold it's going to be? No. <laughs> I didn't, didn't want to hear it. So what I what I did was, um, oh, by are. the way, that's my that's that's a that's a map of my grandfather up there, um, a statue of my grandfather there oh. uh, behind me. Um, <laughs> The, the maps that I sent you, and I think, Peg, you can look at it, because when Peg responded yesterday, she said, is that wind chill? And I'm like, no. So I figured I'd send you both the map of temperature and wind chill, Peg. So is that nighttime lows? That's uh, Sunday morning lows. Yeah. But about overnight. 20 below. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. But Sunday that's, morning. that's so weird, because, oh, okay, never mind. Uh, I was just going to say. I'm Whatever gonna model this is, is very different from other models I've seen. Really? How so? Of the of how low? Well, I don't think you're looking at a model. You're 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 looking at a forecast some that someone mm-hmm. decided to put onto a panel. That's different. Okay. So yeah, that's for, that's the like forecasts, having, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that that's like having like like data in numbers, and someone goes, "Eh, I don't think so. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with ten above." Um, but it's showing. This is the third run in a row where it's showing some extremely cold air on the backside of the secondary system. So, I mean, I don't watch TV weather, so I'm not going to say what other people are showing, but this is what's out there right yeah. now, and um, it looks cold. But if you guys want to talk about what happened overnight. No, it looks I'm very more, cold. I'm more, I'm more. <laughs> yeah, yeah no. Mike, like you. I'm just yeah. going to say I'm I'm kind of fascinated by because you sent the map yesterday, and I mm-hmm. looked at it, and you're talking about numbers in the minus digits Fahrenheit. 
Uh, and I right. really, I really haven't yeah, seen anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that. That's crazy, kind of cold. Um, and you would think that if that were some kind of reality that some other folks uh, would be talking. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just asking questions here. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> right. Right. No, I, I understand that. Well, how about this? While you have me on the, on the air right now, yeah. I will look at the, at the latest version of the European model, which most people like to use as like a secondary guess. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> it's definitely showing temperatures um, about maybe in the single digits to near zero by Monday morning. So the European model is, is a little bit a little bit behind the US model, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. we will most likely see a significant drop off in temperatures, whether it's not Sunday, definitely Monday and Tuesday will most likely be about 10 degrees below zero for overnight lows and afternoon highs in the single digit. So if it doesn't happen on Tuesday, it'll definitely happen, but if, if it doesn't happen on Sunday, It'll definitely happen by Monday or Tuesday. How about yeah. that? And you're talking yeah. not this week, but the following Tuesday. Correct. Correct. The following week. Yeah. And, yeah. and much of this is because of how much snowpack is now everywhere. Yeah. I, well, it's, it's a couple of things. It's it's first off, the pattern has definitely changed. It's mm -hmm. gone to one of a more uh, northwesterly flow with a little bit more waves in it. And all you need is like a couple of different, you know, events, one, two, deliver the snow, one to deliver the cold, one to deliver another shot of cold, and one another shot of snow and another another shot of cold. So you just don't get cold. It has to be a cumulative effect over a period of time. But, but let me go through some of the numbers here from a standpoint of what happened overnight. Uh, 9.6 inches on the west side of Chicago, uh, 9.3 inches in Westchester, uh, 9 inches at uh, Lamont, um, 7.2 in Morton Grove, 8 inches in Glenview, 8.5 in Deerfield, 10.1 uh, up near Peg, up by Highwood, um, and about 8.5 in Lake Forest, a little bit further to the south and west, nearly 10 inches uh, at the National Weather Service office um, in Romeoville, so 9.5 down there, 9 inches in Chicago Heights, um, and about 6 inches from Rockford, up to about the state line. So this was a much more healthier snow than the last event. In addition to that, uh, we had a lot more in the way of liquid. So this was actually an event that had almost a 10 to one ratio. So if you got about nine inches of snow, you got about nine tenths of an inch of water, which is great on top of the snow that we had. Um, this is gonna be fantastic if you got a little bit of melting around here on Thursday because really it's not going to be that cold the next three or four days. So as long as we get a little bit of melting, this will be really good um, as we head into the month of February and also into March. Because we're all, think about it, we're only two months away from the beginning of the growing season, right? If you if you count March, I suppose, yeah. I mean, well, well yeah, that would be yeah. the first of April, yeah. So we're we're yeah. we're kind of in the ballpark there. Yeah, absolutely. Count down to that's spring. One, that's, yeah, that's one way of doing it. Now, now Peg, had, Peg had mentioned that there's a lot of drifts up by her. We had 30 mile per hour winds, almost close to 40, right along the lakefront. Uh, but I took a drive along the lakefront, and Peg, you probably noticed this as well. There's a lot of pancake ice um, out on Lake Michigan, which actually built a nice buffer. Um, I was actually walking on that ice around Gilson mm. Beach uh, a couple of days ago on Lee Street as well. So the fact of the matter is, even though we had some really, really strong winds and we had some really high lake levels preceding the storm, there was no beach erosion. So that's how important that's some of that pancake ice is. Yeah, so there's no beach erosion with this particular event. So good news out of the storm all the way around. It snowed and we got beach, no beach erosion. And what's interesting is you sent some stuff earlier in the week, and I'm looking at the map right now. The 10-year ten, ten anniversary of the Groundhog Day blizzard. And by the way, Groundhog Day is Tuesday, and that is Legata's birthday, just letting you know. Oh, happy birthday to Legata. That's right. Um, does, and does, do you take her out to see her shadow? <laughs> I could. I'll throw her in the snow <laughs> and see how she reacts to that. Uh, I, I would not do that to my kitty. That, uh, that, that, that's my shadow right there. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at this map you said, uh, the 10-year anniversary of the Groundhog Day blizzard, which was uh, they called Snowmageddon around here um because we had uh, about 20 inches of snow and um and that that system uh, as you point out in the map went all the way up from texas into uh maine 
It, it was crazy. That was a, a, a go ahead. Well, that was without a doubt, probably one of the biggest snowstorms that hit the Midwest in 30 years. So when people say, <clears throat> um, wow, you did a great job with that. that that's like, that's like a Mack truck, you know, running over an ant. What's the chances of it being killed? hundred percent. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's trying to catch a that's an analogy. So the, well, there you go. But the thing about it, Peg, as Mike pointed out, this storm um, affected 31 states. Yeah. We're under winter storm warnings. We had nine states under blizzard warnings. In fact, the Chicagoland dairy was under a blizzard watch almost 36 hours in advance. 36 hours in advance. We had a record number of hours of visibility down below a quarter of a mile at O'Hare. And it wasn't so much that the storm had a really deep low pressure. It was because there was this enormous high pressure system over Montana of like 1050 millibars. So you had this huge gradient that literally drove the snow horizontal um, at speeds of over 50 miles an hour. And I distinctly remember during that event, the snowflakes were very, very small, almost like they were pulverized. So mm -hmm. that alone obviously added to the drifts. And then because it lasted so long, um, I mean, this storm last night lasted, what, about 12 hours? That thing went on for 24 hours. Well, this is so still going. I'm looking outside. It's coming down really pretty yeah. well right now here and in Logan Square. And you've had snow the whole broadcast. I haven't had any during the broadcast. It yeah, must it, be a it, band. It, it, yeah, it depends on, like, where this little lake effect band is setting up. I mean, we'll get another two inches out of this. But, I mean, from an accumulation standpoint, this is nothing compared to the 2011 uh, one. But the thing about that event, if you look at some of the pictures – of the cars that were stuck on Lakeshore Drive. Right. There was no snow. There was no snow on the beach. And the ice actually went out about 10 miles. So all the snow that was on the ice blew across the beach, across that little narrow path of Grand Park or Lincoln Park, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it's Lincoln Park at that Link, point. Lincoln Park um, on the north side, right. Yeah, yeah it's Lincoln Park. Um, I don't know why I said Grand Park. But there was <laughs> snow that was blown across Grand Park but most of the ice was already kind of like packed in along Monroe and Burnham Harbor, where the ice in that area from North Avenue to Fullerton kind of almost slides right up to the shoreline. So the snow literally came off the lake, over the beach, and onto northbound Lake Shore Drive. That's the reason why those cars were stuck. Now they went in there and they took out a couple of you know, center medians and said, well, now if the cars get stuck, we'll pull them out. That's not gonna work. What they need to do is they need to plant a snow fence of some sort of shrubs made out of, I don't know, you would know better, Mike or Peg, you know, anything that like a spruce or a pine that's low to the ground and blocks the snow from going over that area onto Lakeshore Drive. They have still not done that. And that's what they need to do. And I have to give you some credit. And by the way, uh, one of the problems with, with a conifer that you might plant there is there's so much salt that mm -hmm. comes off of Lakeshore Drive, that it'll kill those things. Um, it's tough. It depends on how far they are from the actual drive itself. Uh, you see them, I see them plant conifers along the drive all the time, and within a couple of years, they're dead. And I haven't even told you my story this week about the earlier snowstorm where I'm, uh, I, I walk out to the front door, and my Good Samaritan neighbors are throwing salt down, and I'm running out the door with my like my hair like this and I'm going no salt no salt no salt and uh and so people it, think it, it I'm the Jimmy crazy Stewart accent yes I am Something the, like Jimmy Stewart I am the crazy old guy on the block who yells at people not to put salt down because I know it'll kill the plants you don't they put weight more than they need all the time um and folks if you're using salt it's not good for your pets it's not good for uh your plants uh it's it's not good for the water it gets into the, the sewer systems, and, and I saw uh, yeah. a stat on that. But the point I wanted to make was 10 years ago, you called it on my show. You said, those folks need to watch out because that snow is going to blow right off that lake, yeah. uh, and there's nothing yeah. to impede it. And and then, boom, it shut down Lakeshore Drive. And I remember yeah. that to this day because you had that forecast and nobody else did. Yeah. And, and if you recall, about a, about three or four days later, you know, Mayor Daly was given a press conference, and there were really no tough questions directed towards him. And there's two reasons. A, he was leaving office um, in literally a month and a half, 
and B, uh, Maggie Daly had terminal cancer. Yeah. And it was, it was basically hands off on asking him any questions on why the city botched Lakeshore Drive. Whereas in 1999, that was the other blizzard that we had, almost 20 inches of snow. That happened on January 1st, um, overnight, Saturday night into a Sunday. They closed down Lakeshore Drive, and they could because no one was going to be using it. And when they shut it down, literally from 57th Street to Hollywood, you can bring the plows up there once an hour and keep it clear. But this was a work day. It was in the middle of what was the the set, the first of February is when it happened, and you had tons of cars on it. So all it took was one bus that couldn't make it over Fullerton Avenue, and you went from four lanes to three lanes to two lanes. And even though it was only from Fullerton to North Avenue, if you count the, the, the number of cars in the lane, you're up to 250 cars. And that's a lot. That was catastrophic. Wow. Those cars were there. Those cars were there for two days. And that shut down not only Lakeshore Drive northbound, but also southbound as well, because they obviously had to help the people. So think about when you shut down uh, the, the largest, busiest urban highway in the third largest city in the United States for two days. Um, that pisses a lot of people off and the city and they really got a pass on that one. Yeah. All right. Well, we need to get a forecast and I want your forecast for what kind of cold you think we'll be getting a week from now. Yeah. So this little bit of snow coming at us now is on the backside of this, um, deep low pressure, which believe it or not, this energy came out of California, which produced 80 to hundred inches of snow. So good news for them. This is going to make a dent in their drought. Um, and now it's going to move to the east, develop into a secondary low off the coast, 12 to 18 inches of snow from Philadelphia to New York to Boston. Um, so just about everybody in the United States is benefiting from this from a standpoint of snow. Because granted, you know, the ski resorts need it. They've, they've been kind of screwed in the northeast. They've gotten the snow, and then it went away. So this is good for them. Um, we'll get right back into the low 30s during the day tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So there's really no Arctic air behind the system. Matter of fact, you go outside right now, it's not that cold. 30 yeah. degrees after the storm, it's not bad. Um, however, on Thursday, winds turn around to the south. I would not be surprised if we get rain, believe it or not. So rain late Thursday into Friday, and then temperatures begin to fall back in the mid-20s on Friday, maybe low to mid-20s Saturday. And if things work out, like the GFS is saying, we'll be below zero Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Now, is it going to be 20 below or 10 below? Um, I don't know at this point, but it's definitely going to be about 40 degrees colder next Monday than it will be tomorrow Monday. How about that for a forecast? I think that's a good one. And uh, I tried to send those maps to myself here. Uh, and, of course, Peggy, not, they haven't shown up in 10 minutes. I'm still waiting for the email to work So I because I wanted to show that map. Uh, that Rick uh, sent we'll, we'll us. We'll get it this up morning. on Facebook. We'll get it up. We'll get it up there. Uh, Rick, thanks so much, buddy. Uh, I have to. When we're done here, I have to go shovel, uh, un unless Brian shows up, and uh, and then I can yell at some people. No salt. No salt. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I am. And as and as, uh, as Bugs Bunny said, he reminds me of my brother George. <laughs> you know, you guys, I can see the resemblance. Just, just Google Bugs Bunny, and he reminds me of Brother George. It's funny. He, that's when he was imitating uh, Liberace playing piano. Uh, See what happens when you give me snow? I turn back into a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing. All right. Thanks, Rick. We'll see you next Thanks, week. Thanks, Rick. All right. Uh, so before we go, it made me think that um, if there's enough snow, somebody will be out in the snow doing this. Alan! 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 <laughs> in, Alan! In, Alan, in the in the blizzard. Alan. Okay. Anyway, I just needed to get that, that in. That's the squirrels in the yard. I, yeah, I guess so. I uh, want to thank uh, everybody who was on the program today. Uh, and boy, what a great show this was. Uh, Nick Mink from Sitka Salmon Shares. Don't forget to order your uh, Sitka Salmon Share with uh, $25 off if you use the word Novak25. And it's N-O-W-A-K. Um Christine Esposito, Barbara Cooper, Tyrone Dobson, meteorologist Rick DeMaio. Uh, no Kayla, she's off to New Zealand, but uh, Legata and Basil, and of course Kathleen helping as always. Until next time, go green or go home. And if I can find this, oh yeah, here it goes. Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? 
I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. Thank <laughs> you.